Hey, guess who? I had a lot of... No, that's not even fair to say. I had two or three uh, people since I started doing the... If this routine is the Holy Grail, why aren't we all doing it? And I started that, I think, last fall. So I've had a couple of a handful of people that have um, sent me a message asking about Laurie Frank and her book, Lexus, and why I haven't reviewed that. And she's the best trumpet teacher ever, and she was a living girlfriend for Carmine Caruso and studied with him and all kinds of stuff. There's just more to tell. And I thought, well, the first thing i got to do is at least get what she's known for. She's known for this book called Flexus, and I just ordered it um, off of um, Amazon. It's about $30 and change. And I went through the whole book, um, and I pulled out what probably is the hardest thing in the entire book, and I'm going to try to sight read it for you right now. I guess it's this 827. Uh, it's a two-pager. I haven't really... I'll have to double-check again on YouTube, but um, I haven't... I don't think I've seen or heard anybody do a 2 7 It's on, on page 128 in the Flexus book. Uh, I just skimmed through the book. I haven't actually gone through the entire thing, but I will when I do the, my um, review on it for the Holy Grail series. But... Um, I just went through it and thought I would take the hardest one and try to sight read it for you guys right now. It's um, it's a late at night, so I'm going to be um, playing with the mute on. And um, well, this book is so new it won't flatten out. So uh, let's uh, grind it up a little bit. This I'm pretty abusive with books. Okay, so. Um, this is A27 in the Flexus book by Laurie Frank. And this one says something about quick register changes. Um, looks like this is about the tempo. Yeah, you probably can't see that. It's actually a 76. Yeah, it, it's, trust me, this is 76. I'm not going to leave the metronome on the whole time because I might take some liberties with it. This range goes from. As best I can tell, the low F sharp uh -huh. up to F. So, um, what does that expand? Almost three octaves. And then she's talking about quick register changes. So, there's a mixture of um, tonguing and slurring, and best I could tell going through here. Um, it looks like, as I can look through, there's lots of accidentals, and usually when I see lots of accidentals, uh, that tells me that the, the piece I'm about to play is going to be actually in a different key than what the register suggests at the beginning, you know, the, the key signature. Uh, at the beginning, it suggests that we're either in C major or A minor, because there's, there's no flats or sharps in the key. Uh, but with all the accidentals, of which there are a ton of them, um, it's got to be in um, different keys, or uh, at least at least one different key than C or A, C major or A minor, and it might be more than that. So let's just see what happens. I am working with my mute. I can't blast right now. It's late at night, but I just thought I would go ahead and go through this before I move on to other things. I got a really important uh, video coming out for uh, for female brass players, and um, I'm working on that one. That that's the one that's going to be the sweet spot. Uh, at least it was a couple years ago. So, uh, and I didn't make a video a couple years ago, so uh, I'm excited about that. But uh, so I wanted to see what I could do on this one, sight reading, and uh, put it up there because I noticed people are trying to do some other stuff. But uh, you know, I haven't seen any. But this is the hardest one in my opinion. You can't, I can't find anything harder. Uh, so let's just see what happens. Uh, <sighs> metronome marking at. Yeah, right around there. I'll probably stay somewhere around there. Maybe it's a little slower from side reading now. 
she did it's, it's kind of a, it's a good melody um, for sight reading yeah made me blink a few times caught me just a little bit um, so what can I say I'm not gonna go into a lot of review about her stuff right now that's gonna come later but I like this I like how she did this um, it, it's a great composition uh, did it challenge me a little bit on the intervals well yeah I mean, uh, that's sight reading, folks. Uh, no one's ever seen me put any of her stuff up or talk about her at all. I, I don't think that you've ever heard it, me talk about her, because uh, I don't really know that much about her, except for what I've just now been learning. But, um, okay, so that was the Flexus book in the very back, and I picked the hardest etude out of the Flexus book, of etude seven, and I sight read it right in front of you at night. Had to have my mute in because I, uh, you know, didn't want to get people banging on the door. Probably was still loud anyway. So I liked it. Um, do I think most professional and advanced players could could go through that like that, or maybe even get it down after working on it? I don't think so. No, I think we can line up 10 professional players and give a mix, mixture of jazz and classical, and I think, um, I think a lot of them would have a problem with this one for two reasons, range and flexibility. And the third one would be um, the slotted accuracy that comes with uh, spending a lot of time in the upper register on the horn. So for the classical players who kind of poo-poo doing things above high C and high D because they don't really have to play it in their orchestra, um, or jazz, you know, jazz trumpet guys that are, you know, always be bopping in the staff and a little bit above. They're not going to have the the acumen and the facility and the the accuracy of, you know, picking notes. I mean, heck, I, what, what was I doing? I was picking out E flats and D's and C's and high F's just out of thin air. Um, I really like the last two lines. I mean, that kind of gave me a run for my money. Um, Starting the last two lines, I liked it. It skipped around. I like it. I think most people are going to find it very, very tough. 
That's all for now. I'll be back at some point with my review and how Lori Frink's Flexus fits into the Holy Grail series. Bye for now. Hey, this is just a little video commentary on why musicians, almost all musicians are average. And you're going to find out right now why that is. Right now, it is about, I don't know, I think I, I think it was around 8.30 at night. And I'm at a college. And I wanted you to check something out. What are you noticing right now as I walk through the college? Did you figure it out? All these practice rooms are empty except for me. So now you know why most musicians are average. I mean, what the hell? You know that if you're going to be good, you have to come and put in some practice time at night. You didn't get all your practice done during the day. Why? Because you were going to school or you had a job. Or if you're a non-traditional student, you have a family. You have a wife or a husband or kids. Look at this. Every practice room is unused here. And it's like this practically every, every time that I come here in the late afternoon or evening, no one's here. When I was a freshman in college, my typical practice time was 6 p.m. until about midnight. I also put in some breaks, but Man, I was grinding it out, baby. That's when I was 18 years old. So you want to be an average musician, you do what these people are doing, and they're not here practicing. That's if you want to be average. I mean, I just find it a travesty. In this whole music department, no one here is woodshedding anything. And I'm here practicing, and I'm already, you know, I'm already a decent player. But I'm here practicing. That should tell you something right now. If you're not practicing every time you get a chance, you're going to be average. This is an example, this gorgeous practice room, of why I don't have a lot of competition in an empty practice room. Isn't that sad? I guess it's good for me, but it's really a sad state of affairs that people don't have enough work ethic to get their butt in here and start doing some practicing. It's sad, but anyway, now you know why most musicians are average. Most don't rise to the top. Most don't um, get recognition as being world-class caliber is exactly what you're looking at, empty practice rooms at a decent hour of the evening when people should be here working their butt off. Thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day. El Cas, baby. El Cas Valve Oil. It might come off, come out backwards because of um, the way I'm filming this. There you go, because uh, I'm doing the self the self video here.
So I get asked a lot of different questions. Some of them are a little tiny mundane questions. What mouthpiece you play on? You know, where'd you study? Who'd you study with? You know, what kind of valve oil do you use? Blah, 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 blah. And, um, or do you think blue juice is good? Or do you think the new, and bleep, I'll leave out the celebrity's name oil is good. And I got one thing to say. I don't have any affiliation with LCAS, but I've used LCAS practically all my life. And it's the best all around valve oil. It doesn't stick. In fact, you can watch a video of me doing some outside practicing in 22 degrees and my valves are still good to go. Um, yes, I know about Blue Juice and I've tried it. I know about Yamaha valve oil. I've tried it. I know about Bach valve oil and I've tried it. And Shulky and on and on and on and on and on. And then, then there's the the Blue Juice and the newfangled this and that that uh, some of the you know known trumpet players and celebrities uh, don't buy into all that bullshit. You need Alcast. That's it. In fact, uh, right after this, I'm going to put a clip of my fast fingers. And I, I tell you what, um, my fingers and the demand that I play um, on this instrument is probably twice as fast as anybody else promoting their own valve oil. In other words, they can't play as fast as me, and their demand for fast fingers and fast valves is not where I'm at. And I'll put a clip couple of clips showing you how fast I play and uh, what's required for me to be able to play that fast. Oh. Alcas hits the spot. Yeah, Alcas. Don't get anything from Alcas. It's just that I feel like I owe them a little plug because Alcas has served me well for years and years and years. And you don't need to try anything else. It's probably available right now in your local music store. It's three or four dollars a bottle. Maybe it's got up to five. Lasts for a long time. You don't need anything else. You don't need any fancy bullshit. Just go get you some Alcas, and that'll be the best thing for your horn. I'm Kurt Thompson, and I approve this message. Hey, this will be a discussion about brass embouchure and the differences in embouchure and how even if you think you might have a bad embouchure, it can be overcome by strengthening your embouchure from all different kinds of directions. And I'm going to play some embouchures that um, are bad for me and that typically... For me, I would not be able to play very well using these type of embouchures. Now, one thing to keep in mind, no one embouchure is really bad for an individual. And so what that really means is what might be bad for me and I sound horrible on might be really good for you. And so it depends on, if you look carefully, your lips, how long they are, how short they are, how narrow they are, how thick they are, how thin they are, your teeth. How much of an overbite you have, how much of an underbite you have, um, if they're crooked, if you're wearing braces, so if maybe you have um, a partial denture, so it can include a lot of different things, and also your just your bone and jaw structure. That's why I think that um, some brass coaches and teachers can do more harm to a student by forcing them into a particular embouchure. Um, for example, the most common would be centered and a little bit more on the top lip. That seems to be you know, the most common. But not everybody is going to do well with that particular embouchure. Um, the other thing that you should be aware of is that if you attempt to drastically change your embouchure, it seems like in my experience and opinion, people that have done that end up really not faring any better. In fact, a lot of people get worse. So if you think a big drastic embouchure change is the answer, you're probably barking up the wrong tree. So let's look at some various embouchures. Um, here we can see. For me, I tend to play a little, a little higher. So I guess you got your um, high, high player or high lip placement uh, position. 
you got your medium or middle and your low. So those, those would be the different um, placements. So high would be, it's probably high. Now I can go higher, but. That's probably close to where I normally would play. Now what happens if I wasn't playing that way and I was using a you know an embouchure that was bad for me? Um, let's try something. Let's drop it way down. So I'm up here. Let's go on way down. Way down. Hear the difference in tone quality? But guess what? I'm still able to get the high C. I'm still able to play. But it doesn't sound that good. But I can still do it. Um, let's go maybe um, medium. So normally I play here. Let's go down just a little bit. Seemed like it noticeably flat on the high C. I think I was flat on the first one too. But So I'm still able to play. Now I'm going to... I'm going to be tying this all into a huge point here. Um, okay, so now let's talk about angles. So I can use my normal armature here. What if I bringled it up? Because I see people playing like this. Okay, it had a significant high angle to it. One of the most interesting um, armatures I've ever seen is uh, by Stan Mark, the famously trumpet player for Maynard Ferguson. I don't know how he can play the way he does. Um, take a look at it. It's like he puts the trumpet up straight, and then he comes up to <laughs> he comes up to the mouthpiece. You really got to watch him do it when he's playing live. It's he. Um, it's very interesting. He's got the trumpet here, and then he'll come up. So the trumpet's actually straight out, but he's coming up at this angle. So, <laughs> now the, most of the amateurs that I'm showing you are ones that I really couldn't play on. In fact, if I was playing on them, I might be just like you are right now. If you have a particular question about your amateur and that it's not working for you, well, if my trumpet teacher long ago had said you need to play like this, like Stan Mark, so I got the horn out, I'm coming into it like this. Well, I mean, if I was using that amateur all along, thinking that that, that was how it was supposed to be, um, I would be having a lot of trouble, and I would be wanting to look at a video like this to change my amateur. Thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe. Click on my website link and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day. Okay, I'm gonna share a little strategy that I've used over the years when I really want to develop extraordinary power and volume. And uh, not all the time I really have to have that. But when I want to be doubly sure, when I really want to know that I don't care who the fuck shows up on the gig or who shows up, I'm going to be killing it, okay? And that one technique that I use consistently to just totally kill it with a wall of sound, it's so simple. You probably already thought of it before. Want to take a wild guess what it is? Come on now. Uh, I'm not talking about long tones and lip trills and glissandos and heat exercise. Uh, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking a shift in how you practice, not what you practice. Just a little bit. Gives you the certain edge of power. 
Ready? Practicing outside. See, it was so simple, it was right in front of you the whole time. Of course, you don't want to practice outside all the time, and you can't. It might be raining or snowing or freezing. Guess what, folks? I have practiced out in 10 degree weather and colder. I practice out in the rain in Seattle. I practice out underneath the Bay Bridge in San Francisco. Um, I practice at the water. You know, I practice out my car window on um, hot and sunny days and um, cold nights, rainy nights. So the reason I do this is because there's, um, I can't explain the science behind it. Maybe it's because this huge uh, acoustic environment you're, or non-acoustic environment that you're trying to fill up uh, with your horn. Maybe that's part of it. But I'm here to tell you that if um, just a few times a week you spend an hour outside where you're unrestricted. This means you can't you can't play somewhere where you're, where you're going to feel restricted and you can't can't play out. That's going to kind of quash this particular technique and way of playing. So you need to be somewhere where you can blow out. I remember when I was a senior, finishing up my senior year in high school, and I had a summer before I was going to start at Austin Peay State University, and uh, there was a couple of cool solos. We did Everybody Loves the Blues, and I knew that the odds were very, very against me um, that I was going to get any solos as a freshman. And so I ended up practicing out, I would say out of a seven day um, week, I spent four to five days um, at a farm who might not even know who, who owned the farm. There was just a farmhouse there in the middle of nowhere in Tennessee. This was in Hendersonville. It was god awful hot. Um, I would take my horn out there and um, I had a Chevrolet Chevette and at least an hour a day I would pop in my Maynard tunes and I would just play as loud as I could with as much power but still trying to sound good and still trying to be in tune, still trying to be accurate with a good tone, but I would just blow it out as much as I could without any restriction. And I'm here to tell you that when I started marching band season as a freshman, pimply faced 18 year old kid at Austin Peay State University, man I came in there and killed, annihilated. I mean I just played probably twice as loud. Ask anybody there. I mean, I, and guess who got the solo? I got the solo and everybody loves the blues. So uh, I achieved my goals, but I came in there almost overkill. I mean, I was just so powerful and loud. I mean, I could really just um, almost bury the marching band if I chose to at that point. Of course, I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I did know, I did stumbled on this particular technique. So if you've been, um, if, if you've been doing a lot of different things, let's say that you even took my course and you added three or four notes to your range. You can't stop there. I mean, I'm not stopping. So you got, let's just say that you already got a good range and you're watching this tutorial because you're just killing time. You already got double G's and double A's and whatever. You're a super nice, lovable, likable guy or gal and you get lots of gigs because of that. Plus you have the range and talent. You're watching this video because you're just killing time. Well, don't change anything except uh, take yourself outside a couple times a week for an hour and just go through your pedal tones, your long tones, your lip slurs, your lip trills, your glissandos, some of your scales and tonguing exercises, then practice a couple of licks up an octave or if you know a couple of Maynard or Doc or Bill Chase, uh, Bud Brisboy licks or anything like that, then uh, practice those outside. Give yourself an hour uh, a couple times a week. I will guarantee you, guarantee you now, I'm not saying that maybe, I'm saying guaranteed your sound and the power and the volume that you can pour, oh, wait a minute, this is kind of counterintuitive, I, this in the apartment, I have to use these because man, I play so loud um, when I'm going for it. The power that's going to come out of this bell of your horn will increase. There's just no doubt about it. And if you don't even um, believe me, if you think I'm just um, blowing smoke up your, you know, you know what, try an experiment for two weeks. I'm talking to everybody here. For two weeks, pick two days out of the week where for an hour a day, could be at night or during the day, you're going to go outside somewhere. You got to find some place that you can go and just blow as loud as you want to 
and not have to worry about someone yelling at you or chasing you away. So here's your experiment. Take two weeks, two days per each week, one hour on each of those days, and just fill up this horn and just fill up the whole sky and the whole environment and the atmosphere with, with your sound. And you come back to me after two weeks of doing that and tell me that you didn't get anything out of that, that nothing changed. Uh, you're not going to be doing that. You're going to be coming back and you're going to be going, um, I was trying to prove you wrong, Kurt, but oh my God. When I go into the big band now that I play in my Monday night rehearsal, I have to hold back because I just have this wall of sound now that's just coming out the end of my bell. So there you have it. It's um, not exactly what you're practicing because I have a lot, all that covered in a lot of other tutorials. It's how you're practicing. So if you practice in a little tiny stuffy room in a music store, you know those those music stores they have those little tiny, you know, forty feet, forty square foot rooms. It's like a closet, just barely enough for you and a student to fit in, and it's just horrible. And it's all tiled in, it's all acoustic. Well, uh, that is the opposite kiss and cousin of this particular technique. I mean, really, you got to find yourself outside outside and be blowing putting some power even on the pedal tones in fact i did that earlier tonight i spent 15 minutes um of working pedal tones from tier one all the way to tier two i skipped tier three and i went to tier four and outside i wanted when i play my pedal tones i want to hear them come back to me on the echo especially the the tier four uh, tier two and tier four i played as loud as i could and i want to hear that snap back from the reverberation the echo just from the environment and I got it so anyway this is one technique that you need to um, highlight that you need to highlight and try and once you try it and you become a believer um, you need to dedicate once or twice a week twice is my preference but at least once a week let loose get outside um, if you can go to a high school uh, football stadium uh, or a college and no one's there on that particular time just let her rip once a week, twice is what I recommend. Um, two days a week, one hour each time is what I recommend. But the very least, if you can't do that, just once a week, blowing some steam out of the this horn. And you are just going to be uh, um, thanking me over and over and over again. All right. Uh, this, this, again, highlight this tutorial. This one was high value for you. Uh, so no matter who you are, what you practice, if you're a classical person, if you're a commercial person, if you're a lead person, um, uh, if you're just a strict jazzer, you know, a la Chet Baker, Miles Davis kind of kind of person, if, whatever, it doesn't really matter what you do. If you take this way of practicing, oh, I just recommended, you're going to up your game. And it's going to be almost instantaneously. Two weeks, folks. Keep fighting the good fight because I know that you will. Subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day. When it comes to equipment, a lot of people are always asking, not just me, but um, just about anybody, you know, should I play on a large mouthpiece? Do I need to play on a, a large bore horn, you know? And band directors who don't know shit will say, yeah, I want you to play on the largest mouthpiece as possible so you can get the best sound. And I want you to play on the biggest bore horn so you can get the biggest sound. Uh, well, they don't know their ass from the hole in the ground. Let's just face it. My idea of playing is to play on the smallest equipment you can to get the biggest and best sound. So that's part again, to get the biggest and best sound. Okay? So, if your clarinet band director thinks you need to be playing on a 3C or 1.5C because that's just what he learned in his uh, one semester of brass class in college, uh, you, you can just play and say, yeah, that's great, I'm, I'm going to look into that. No. You want to play on what feels most comfortable and what allows you to play the best with the best sound. In most cases, it's not going to be a Bach 1.5C. 
if I had played a Bach one half C and do it all commercial, jazz, rock, swing, big band, marching band, symphonic and wind ensemble, and Broadway and pops, it won't be a one and a half C for most people unless you have super duper thick lips. Okay? Or if you have a very small bore horn or a medium bore horn. So that brings up my next topic. So it turns out that a lot of times when you mix and match sizes, um, you get a much better response. So, for example, this is a Bob Reeves. Probably can't see it. Let me see if I can tilt it a little bit. Eh, I still don't see it in the camera. You see it, folks? Well, just trust me. This is a Bob Reeves Brass Ball Original V Raptor. Uh, this is a .468 bore, which for most trumpets, that's a pretty large bore horn. But I have a customized Bob Reeves mouthpiece. Relatively shallow. Got a very wide rim because that's, that's my original rim. And it's put on a Bob Reeves. Oh. The Bob Reeves. Uh, 42SV. 42 Sam Victor. And I've got a number two sleeve. So the body of it, the the um, the cup and the back bore and the sleeve would be a Bob Reeves 42 SV uh, number two sleeve. Uh, this is a Neil Sanders rim, which is really a super duper. It's wider than a 1C rim, so, but this is shallow. So uh, you might want to play around with this shallow into large bore. It seems to make a pretty good combination, or something like a one and a half C or a one and a quarter if you really love the feel of it into something like a uh, medium bore like a step bore uh, say like the right off the cuff is a Yamaha 8310Z um, I can't think of it might be a shoehorn I'm not sure but anyways the 8310Z I had one at one point it's a step bore horn but it's a point 450, which is a medium bore, and then I guess it turns into a large bore at the end. But uh, now that might be a good combination with a larger mouthpiece. Larger mouthpiece, smaller bore horn. Not necessarily small bore, but just smaller than a typical 0.459. We all know 0.459 and 0.460 are the typical medium large bores that you encounter in most brands. So you need to start thinking, um, mixing and matching. I, I, but um, without, with uh, that being said, I believe play on the smallest equipment possible where you can sound the best and get the biggest sound. Not so you sound like shit so you can play high. <laughs> I didn't say that. Play on the smallest equi equipment possible to give you the best sound and the biggest sound. Um, Want to hear something wacky? Uh, Maynard Ferguson had some of his best recordings on a Con 38 I believe it's a Con 38B horn. I checked that out. Guess what? It's a 0.438 bore. Hello. That's not even medium. That's small. Okay. He was getting huge, huge, big sounds. I believe he was playing stuff like Tenderly and Hey There and Maria and Somewhere back in the mid to late 60s. I mean, he got this huge sound um, out of a 0.438 bore horn on a Con 38B. So... That's an example. If you need another idea about a smaller bore horn, I believe uh, the, I played on the Con 22B horns a couple times, and I believe ah, where are they? Ah, you're gonna have to look that up. It just slipped my mind right off right off the cuff. It might be a .433 bore. It's a real small bore horn, .433. Another one would be the Con Coprion, spelled C O C O P R I O N. You can look that up. The Con Coprion. Now these are all back from a long time ago, the the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, of course, you're going to use a larger mouthpiece with those horns, and that's the the kind of mix and match what I'm talking about. So to le to leave you with a couple of um, summaries, uh, play on the smallest mouthpiece and horn possible to give you the best tone and the biggest sound. Another strategy would play with mix and match a larger mouthpiece with a smaller bore horn. Or this, in my case, I have a huge large bore of a horn, 0.468, and a relatively small mouthpiece. And I really like the combo um, that, that uh, the setup is with this one. 
I just feel like if I want to turn it up, I will turn it up. And um, I can really be loud on this baby if I want to. Especially when I'm above high C. So there you go. That's how you figure out what size of mouthpiece to play on and what size of horn. And as always, that's my story, baby, and I'm sticking to it. Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson, and welcome to my channel. That's youtube.com slash your brass instructor. Thanks for just watching the video that you did. Maybe it's the first one that you've watched, or maybe you've watched tons of my videos. In fact, as of June 2016, as a brass player and trumpet player, I have the most tutorials free on the planet. I have over 600 videos on my YouTube channel currently, all free. So again, thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day. the final part of the three stages of compression. So what was the first stage? Diaphragm. Second stage, the bottleneck here at the throat and the tongue arch. Now the third stage, what do you think that may be? Third stage of compression. Tick, tuck, tick, tuck, tick, tuck, right here. The air's got to come out some way, right? And it comes out through your lips, not your nose. It comes out here. So, we build up a tremendous amount of pressure in the diaphragm. Of course, that goes up to here. And we the air doesn't come out of our, our head like a blowhole in a whale. So, it's actually bent here, um, which would meet some resistance here. And then as your tongue arches, it meets even more resistance. Now, we've really got... An amazing amount of compression on this air just an amazing amount this air is coming out very very fast very cool very compressed so the third and final stage of compression for air is the aperture and don't let aperture scare you it's just the fancy word for the opening the little crack little hole between your bottom and top lips bottom and top that's it. Now, if we don't have much tension there, I'll make my lips nice and like that. Blah, 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 blah. And I go to blow. Let's say if I do everything else right. No tension, no. It's all, it's all flimsy, flimsy, right? You can see how this is quite important. This this will destroy the good work that you've done on the first two stages of compression. So if you got those down, but this is weak, you know, like wet spaghetti noodles, just weak. Uh, you, you know, your lips are just you can't hold them together. You you've lost everything. You've lost everything that you've gained for. Now I'm being really extreme, right? So you know. Even a fifth grader has more strength than what I just demonstrated. I'm trying to make it in a point by illustrating the um, hilarious. So what that implies is there has to be some ten tension, some rigidity here to keep the top and the bottom lips from blowing apart. You got to keep that so the, no matter how much pressure that these the the lips here are under they stay together and flow and the reason that you usually will drop range especially uh, due to a lack of endurance or not a lack of endurance but your endurance you just start to gas out it happens to everybody you know you can even watch uh, Maynard play 
and you can see that at some point during some of his live concerts, his he was gassing out, just wasn't able to get the notes. So when you, your lips are not able to hold the last and final stage of compression, just a flinch, just a micromillimeter of them blowing apart just a little bit wouldn't be enough for you to be able to probably even see you're going to drop a note or two notes or a minor third just like that. Now, if your lips are really exhausted and you, they, you go even a little bit more, now, now if you were able to play a double G at the beginning of the gig and it's 1.45 in the morning, you might not just be able to play that anymore uh, because the lips just cannot contain the pressure that's necessary in the compressed air to, to fire out that note. So the third and final stage of compression in this three-part series is um, lip aperture compression right at the very end before the air leaves your body. So that's very, very important. Now you might be thinking, well, what do I do to work on that? And here's where it gets, here's where it gets a little bit ambiguous because um, a good chunk of uh, professional musicians, brass musicians and teachers lump all this into embouchure. All of it. Lips, everything. Except, mm -mm, I don't. I know better. So, yes, your lips are connected to, to um, the muscles around your lips. But the reason I know it's different, not only from a plane experience, but also looking at a cadaver, a, a a human body that was donated to a science, a, a medical facility, usually at a university. And when they pull your skin off, which is another weird thing, this is not musical, it's just, it's weird. It's like we're, we are all wearing a mask. And when you see them, it's just weird. It's just like we're all, all humans are wearing a mask. They can actually take your skin and they'll pull it all the way off and then there's your skeleton you got you got a skeleton like everybody else it's just really weird we're all got a mask on that's what that's what this is you're seeing a mask over over my skeleton but when they do that and they start going through and making different dissections and um, different observations of the musculature you don't have to be a medical student to look carefully at the muscles that are right here and how they connect through the face but then you get to look at the lip muscles and it doesn't even look like a muscle it looks more like gristle so what you're doing is when you look at this you see the feather like striations around and then you see the lips so what does that tell you you don't need to be a pre-med student to figure this stuff out the lips are made of a different tissue there's a different thing going on there a different contraction they're a little bit more independent of the rest of this but they are all still linked together your lips obviously there's not a separation between your lips and the corners and your chin all this stuff so uh, for the people that lump, lump it all into just amateur they're really making a grave uh, mistake and a really grave disservice to their students because there is a difference and the way you can prove that there's a difference is you can actually target and work on the corners and the amateur, and you can target and work on your aperture and the lip strength. In the final stage of in the, the of this three part series of series of compression, that is what you want to be focusing on. You want to be focusing on your lip strength. Lip strength is very simply the, your ability to keep your top lip and your bottom lip as close as you can. Now, of course, this is when you're going higher. Obviously, if you're playing low G below the staff, that's not an issue. But when you want to play higher, that compressed air has got to come out. It's going to be coming out so fast, it's with so much resistance having been built up, that it could blow your lips apart. If it blows your lips apart, you're not able to play high. So we work on a number of different techniques in my 16-week upper register course. But the one that's obvious that you already know about is simple lip buzzing. And then get some of these uni university professors um, that will sometimes passively or indirectly leave a comment. I know they're talking about me. And they're like, well, you know, the thing about it is um, when you lip buzz, it's not really like playing the horn. There's a different thing going on when you do this. And when you do this. Yeah, I know that. I know that. 
So when you play into the horn, we're not lip buzzing into the horn. Hello? I already know that. Lip buzzing is a tool. You, we, I mean, I've demonstrated some stuff, demonstrated some, you know, some cool things about buzzing. And keeping it going, that's, that's more, of a, more of a tool, more of a technique. It has nothing to do with what we really do on the horn. That's a whole different animal. So, but we have to do the lip buzzing to build up this gristle that's in our lips. Check out some of these autopsies and medical cadavers. You'll see I'm not lying. This is kind of a gristly type material. And this is the, mus the fine little feather-like muscles around. We have to do something to strengthen this up. And so lip buzzing works amazing for that. Um, as you may have seen in a couple of my other videos, a lip buzzing is a poison. And you can watch that tutorial. I'm not going to go over that again. But simply said, uh, there's kind of a fine art and, and science and method to lip buzzing. And it's just a little dabble, do you? You do it too much, and now, you've, now you get the opposite of what you wanted. Your lips are stiff, you've weakened them, and now, they, now you don't have range because they can't hold uh, uh, the air compressed coming into the mouthpiece. Uh, which brings me up to another point I think was just slipping my head. Oh, the other reason for um, lip buzzing is responsivity. If your lips can't vibrate that fast in a buzz, um, see if that's a C. Yeah. Middle C. High C. Double C. Well, there's a certain responsivity in your lips to be able to vibrate so um, fast at that frequency. You can understand that you can understand and you can even hear there's a lower vibration there's a lower speed there's a lower frequency there that should have been a double pedal C yes it was as opposed to double C there is just a huge difference in what's going on with the lips and so the lips do have to have this ultra hyper responsivity um, to the vibrations and the frequencies that you're trying to get on the horn. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, brass players and trumpet players. This is the final installment in the three-part series compression and how it might actually relate to your brass playing. Um, you got to have all three parts down, and then after you get all three parts down, they got to be synced up just the right way. Uh, you can't go topsy turvy. You know they got to be. There's there's a certain method to the madness here, and if you'd like to learn about that process, um, you need to look down in the description. I usually leave a link that you can click on, and um, you can go to my site trumpetsizzle.com. You can email me. Um, you're going to have to get involved in a, in um, a program like this. Um, to really take yourself to the next level. Um, otherwise, just, you know, hit and missing um, tips and tricks here on YouTube is not going to take you to that next level. You're going to get a little bit better. But you have to go through the process. You don't go through that process, uh, then you're going to be spinning your wheels for however long that you don't mind spinning your wheels until you actually buckle down and go through that process. So, I'm Kurt Thompson. I'll see you in the next one. Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson and welcome to my channel. That's youtube.com slash your brass instructor. Thanks for just watching the video that you did. Maybe it's the first one that you've watched or maybe you've watched tons of my videos. In fact, as of June 2016, as a brass player and trumpet player, I have the most tutorials free on the planet. I have over 600 videos on my YouTube channel currently, all free. So again, thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here.
Have a great day. Um, the first part is soft aloud, or if you want to write uh, piano to forte, that's fine, or P to F. The second part is soft, loud, soft, piano up to forte, back down to piano, or P to F to P. <laughs> the third part is loud, soft. So you can write forte or fortissimo down to piano, or just F down to piano. The last part is loud, soft, loud. So uh, forte down to piano, up to forte, or if you want to write as F to P to F. Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson and welcome to my channel. That's youtube.com slash your brass instructor. Thanks for just watching the video that you did. Maybe it's the first one that you've watched or maybe you've watched tons of my videos. In fact, as of June 2016, as a brass player and trumpet player, I have the most tutorials free on the planet. I have over 600 videos on my YouTube channel currently, all free. So again, thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day. But it's a tongue arch. With a tongue arch, you can do quite amazing things. So if you can play um, high B flats, Bs, and Cs with the perfectly executed and advanced tongue arch that those high C's automatically turn into E's.
In F's, with no change in the musculature and the strengthening of the embouchure here, tongue arch works wonders. <coughs> That's the second reason that you can't play the, and if it's the top, the second reason, or it's the second place why almost all brass players can't get altitude and can't have good endurance. It seems to be mis mystical and ambiguous, foggy, murky, unclear what the tongue arch really is. But basically, if you can anchor, take the tip of your tongue, that's the tip, take it and put it under, uh, um, behind your teeth, your lower teeth, here's upper, lower, take the tip, go down, yeah, anchor it. I have the tip anchored right at the bottom of my lower teeth, where the teeth kind of almost turn into the gums, you know, right at that gum line, or you run out of teeth. And you can feel the wet gum. That's where you anchor the tip of your tongue. Yeah. And then the tongue arches up. Like you're saying in. Or E I N G swimming. Mm. Yeah. So that's when you're at maximum tongue arch. And here's a good test for you. Now I made another tutorial about this, but it was kind of shorter. So <clears throat> you can try this on different things. Purpose, here's me going from second line G to C on purpose, okay? Okay, you're seeing movement here. I'm also adding a little extra tension when I'm going up to give it push. The way to really get the feeling <coughs> of tongue arch so it's not theory, it's actually something real real that you're doing, is to purposely try not to get the top note, yet raise your tongue in an arch position. So right now I'm going to take a big breath, I'm going to hold a G, but during that time what's happening inside my mouth is this. My tongue is arching up. You already know the tip is placed behind my teeth. So it's going here. Ah. Uh, up. And I'm purposely going to try not to get the C. Watch what happens. Hear that? Of course, it didn't sound good, but I'm purposely trying not to get the C. I don't want the C to come out. Watch again. Again. You notice no movement going on here at all, right? And I'm not, I'm really trying not to let the seed to come out. That's your assignment. If you can get that to happen, you've executed the tongue arch quite perfectly. Now, it doesn't stop there. The tongue has to be developed, and you have to be able to hold the tongue arch under a lot of undue pressure when you're above high C. That pressure will flatten down your tongue, and, you'll, and your range will drop. Not because you don't have chops, because you're not maintaining the tongue arch. So <clears throat> the tongue arch, is you got to get it, but then you have to develop it to withstand the pressure that will be inside your oral cavity when you're really playing in the upper register and beyond. Um, your tongue arch drops just a micromillimeter and you've lost um, two notes on your range, just like that. That's how easy it is. So watch, let's try it on a different note. Um, low C. I'm trying to do that, right? You can tell. What if I take a big breath and purposely stay on that low C? Don't let that G come out. Take a bigger breath this time. The first one came out air because I didn't have any air left.
even low C to G, which is a wider interval, isn't it? It's a, another note wider. So you're going to fifth. Um, now, a lot more air is coming out on low C than it is on G because you, you have the placement of your jaw and your tongue even lower. But still, you could hear that something was happening. In fact, the air started to cut off and on that first one. Did you hear that? It was almost no air. I mean, it was just air coming out. But the low C would not come out. So don't think that was a mistake. The low C would not come out anymore. Let me just see if I can go for the air again because that was pretty important. I'm raising the tongue up to the point where the low C will not vibrate anymore. Well, now that time the note came out. No, hold on, I try it again. I'm trying to keep the low C down, but I'm raising my tongue into a tongue arch. No, it's not going to do it this time. I guess it was kind of a fluke, but still, that was important um, to realize I'm trying to play the low C, which even beginners can get. So you know something was going on inside here. I mean, if I can't play the low C, something really is, is, bad, is bad. And it's gonna, something bad is going to happen. Maybe the, the end of the world tonight. I can't play a low C. And if you can't play a low C, it's probably the same thing. Now, if I play a low C and I do something inside my mouth that causes the low C not to come out, you know I'm doing something. You know something is going on. You just have to know that. So I was probably speeding up the air too fast for the low C to come out. And it was in the little twilight zone area right before the G was going to snap out. So um, I'm not even sure if I've even tried this on C to E. Now, I'm thinking that as you get more narrow in intervals, uh, it's probably going to come out easier. So I'm not sure if this will be the best demonstration or not. Let's find out. <coughs> so middle C to E. Oh, nor normally... Now, without, I'm going to try to keep it at middle C and not let the E to come out. Oh, no. The, okay, it gets easier as you go higher, actually. Yeah, okay, so that's why I was experiencing that air at the low C to G. So uh, this demonstration is actually perfect for you at G to C. And if you do have a range up to about an A to a high C, um, you might want to try it from middle C to E because it's actually easier. But it might be so easy that you don't really get the feeling of it. So um, you've heard me do three different ones. G to C is commonly what I show students. Um, low C to G is going to be harder. And um, C to E is going to be easier. So you've got three different um, intervals that you can slur to. Um, using the tongue arch. Remember, you're trying not to let the top note come out. You're trying not to let the top note come out. That's what you're trying to do. But you're arching up. You're trying to arch the tongue as high as it will arch. But with the goal of not getting that top note. Because if you have the goal to get the top note, then you might add a little bit more pressure here. You might blow harder. You're going to be doing some things unconsciously that you've just already trained yourself to do to get the note to come out. That's why it's important to really, it might go against your ego, but really do not let that top note come out. Just keep arching the note up and hope it doesn't come out. And when the top note does come out, if it does for you, um, then you know that you've got the tongue arch decently perfected, um, but just not strengthened. I mean, the tongue arch, you either get it or you don't, right? It's, there's not really a gray area. You got it perfected, you can do it. Or you don't have it at all. There's not really a middle ground. You either got it or you don't. After that point, it's about developing your tongue and the tongue, tongue arch to really be refined and just amazingly uh, versatile when you're playing. That's where I come in. Have you ever heard that I got a website called trumpetsizzle.com and that I teach a lot of people, uh, especially a lot of advanced and professional players uh, that want to get better with endurance and range? Well, if you haven't heard about it, um, you're just hearing it now. I actually do that. That's kind of actually what I'm good at. And um, I do I'm good at some other things too, but that's, I kind of have this natural knack for helping people out with that. So if you'd like to learn more, uh, you can definitely look at more videos here. 
And if you're watching this, why not go ahead and subscribe? Uh, you can support me. You're, you're going to get an instant um, email when I put up new videos like this. And um, I don't know. I think that you're going to learn something and become a better player. But if you really want to take the horse by the reins and run run with it, you got to do something, and that's called going through the process, which I alluded to earlier in the video. So, but this this tutorial on tongue arch should help you. And now, if you're not getting the note to come out at all, even though you're trying not to, but it still doesn't come out, um, that's where, again, you need a coach, you need someone to work with you on that because that is the second reason you're not able to play high, play with power of the upper register, or even have great endurance. If you're constantly playing in a low C position in the upper register, you're gassing out all the muscles here. You're just putting such a load on them, and that's why you don't have any endurance. So you might even have a little range where you have no endurance. You got to get the tongue arch. It's the second reason people have problems in the upper register and with endurance. Since you've already heard me say that, you mind it's a no-brainer. Work on it. Get it going. It's worth the investment in time. So that's a wrap. Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson, and welcome to my channel. That's YouTube.com/slash your brass instructor. Thanks for just watching the video that you did. Maybe it's the first one that you've watched, or maybe you've watched tons of my videos. In fact, as of June 2016, as a brass player and trumpet player, I have the most tutorials free on the planet. I have over 600 videos on my YouTube channel currently, all free. So again, thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day. So, if Bob O'Neill's casual double high C method was the panacea, the holy grail to trumpet playing, why aren't we all doing it? The fact of the matter is, it's actually a pretty good routine. The fact of the matter, it actually does work. In fact, I have a little bit of essence of that extreme soft playing in my 16-week upper register course. But what there's a disconnect in Bob O'Neill's casual double high C routines because it's the whole thing is about playing extremely softly in the upper register and he's got all these different scales and there's a lot of cool stuff actually so I uh, also he's got it priced right I mean the last time I looked when I got his method years ago it was like under 30 bucks so maybe it's gone up to 50 or 60 I don't know or maybe even 100 but if you can get his method if it's under 100 dollars go get it He's got some good stuff in there. You're going to like it. Now, the disconnect is, wait a minute. If you're playing all this extreme soft stuff, um, how do you get into the Major, Major Ferguson band and blow your head off playing the lead? You know, Bob, how'd you do that? So that's the disconnect that I have, um, unless Bob just used the extreme soft playing to develop a hyper-responsivity in his chops, which is needed to have these, your lips vibrate really fast at that high frequency um, when you're talking about above high C. So if that's what he did it for, then I can understand that. But otherwise, there's kind of a disconnect when you just talk about all this practicing real soft and gaining range. Um, he's on the right track, uh, playing softly. It's hard It's hard to control play softly. And I'm actually playing on a... I don't even have my, my normal mouthpiece sitting over here. I'm playing on a 3C... Kelly plastic or whatever it is, just kind of screwing around with it, but, you know, playing soft takes control. That would be about a triple pianissimo, folks.
because I was really soft, but I was able to get up there not quite to the triples. Um, I believe I got to round double E, give or take. So there is something to be said for applying and practicing extreme soft scales in arpeggios and notes. But is it the holy grail to muscling in to a big fat band, Maynard Ferguson's band? Um, wow. Playing the Michael Haydn or the Brandenburg or the Vivaldi A flat? Um, no, it's not. So, uh, Bob O'Neill, if you watch him play, the dude can play just about everything. I've heard him play some Rafael Mendez trumpet solos that are crazy hard technically wise. He's, you know, played in the Maynard Ferguson's band. And wow, he's just an all around awesome player. I have to think that um, most of us are not um, like Bob, we don't have, he obviously has a lot of talent, so probably whatever he worked on was going to get him to the stature of the plane that he is uh, and the success that he's enjoyed. Most people trying to improve the range do not have his talent, and I'm thinking that you're going to have to work on something else besides casual double IC. However, he's made it so affordable, and it is um, such good stuff that there's no reason not to go out and run and, and get his stuff and do some of it. So the, the premise of practicing extremely soft scales in upper register is, is amazingly good. It's gold and it's worthy. And it's just not the holy grail to, um, to trumpet playing, but it, it may be part of it. So that's Bob O'Neill's. I've never actually met the guy. I just, I've just heard him play on YouTube, the different stuff. and. He's just one of the best all-around players. I mean, he's got the technique of Alan Bazzuti and the chops of, you know, Roger Ingram. And you, wow, can you imagine that? A guy that's got all the, the technique and the style of a classical player, the fast fingers, and then he's got this huge sound and ability to play. He's just the great player. A lot of that probably is talent and not just coming from practicing soft scales. So, anyway, that's my take on casual double C. And Bob O'Neill, and this is Kurt Thompson. My story, baby, I'm sticking to it. Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson, and welcome to my channel. That's youtube.com slash your brass instructor. Thanks for just watching the video that you did. Maybe it's the first one that you've watched, or maybe you've watched tons of my videos. In fact, as of June 2016, as a brass player and trumpet player, I have the most tutorials free on the planet. I have over 600 videos on my YouTube channel currently, all free. So again, thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day. Now a bonus one to really, to really work the tongue. My tongue's about ready to fall out of my mouth right now, but dit tugging. Anybody tell you about dit tugging? D I T. Dit tugging. I might splice this and make it a separate video just just for people who who already know the other stuff and just want to learn about the dit tugging. Dit tugging is about being unmusical but being physical. And it really puts a strong force and impact on your tongue much more than normal single, double. And it's about putting the most force and impact on your tongue. You will definitely feel it on this one. You want to accent as harsh as you can and short, shorten up the note as most as you can together. And it's not about speed. In fact, if you go too fast on this, you'll actually miss the value of the technique. So you don't want to go too fast in the dit tugging because uh, you're going to miss the value. Another way to think about it is try to shove this 
through your mouthpiece. Jam, jam your tongue right through the hole in your mouthpiece. That's what you want to be thinking. Like I said, it's not very musical, but boy, it sure impacts your tongue. Here we go. Dit tonguing, D I T. The reason it's called dit tonguing, it sounds like dit, 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 dit. Sounds just like that. Let me do it again. That took a lot of energy, and it really impacted uh, my tongue quite a bit. Maybe almost as much as the other ones put together. Almost. So that's dit tonguing. Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson, and welcome to my channel. That's youtube.com slash your brass instructor. Thanks for just watching the video that you did. Maybe it's the first one that you've watched, or maybe you've watched tons of my videos. In fact, as of June 2016, as a brass player and trumpet player, I have the most tutorials free on the planet. I have over 600 videos on my YouTube channel currently, all free. So again, thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day. and dilemma of finding an appropriate brass teacher to help you with your high notes and your endurance. So, conundrum, dilemma, big words, right? Not really. It just means that there is an irony when it comes to playing this instrument and teaching it. So if you spend your whole, whole career playing this guy, you're actually probably going to get very, very good at it. But what did you not spend time doing? You didn't spend time teaching. And teaching is not just a craft, it's also an art. And you actually have to do a lot of it and unfortunately cut your teeth and make your mistakes hopefully early on and not screw too many people up before you start getting things right. So what is the conundrum? and the dilemma of a student, typically an advanced student or maybe even um, a semi-pro, wanting to increase the range on their brass instrument, it doesn't matter if it's trumpet. Uh, uh, tuba players, have you heard of Roger Bobo? Hello, I, I will bet uh, you know the whole bank that you can't play as high or as powerful or as, or, or as great or as long as Roger Bobo. I'll just bet the bank, I'll bet your bank along with it. So it doesn't matter if you play this instrument or if you play the, the largest um, brass instrument, tuba. You're going to have to, at some point, want to strengthen up the chops and increase your endurance. So you start looking for a teacher that can help you do that. Um, so you're going to make two mistakes. The first mistake is to look for um, a high-profile celeb-type uh, brass player. And um, since I focus more on the high brass, um, I can just throw off some names. Um, some of these people already passed away. Maurice Andre, Maynard Ferguson, Bill Chase. Uh, alive ones would be John Faddis, um, Wayne Bergeron, Arturo Sandoval. Um, let's go as far as how about Gary Grant? How about Chuck Finley? How about Bobby Shue? 
So the, I just mentioned a bunch of names of people that are living and passing, passed away that are known worldwide for their uh, multifaceted abilities on the trumpet. And all the people that I mentioned have one thing, at least one thing in common, regardless of whether they do classical, commercial, commercial or jazz. They have fantastic chops. Fantastic chops. Amazing chops. Especially when you consider the best trumpet player in the world, Maynard Ferguson. You can't beat him at all. And um, I have another video coming out where he actually plays along with um, Clark Terry and Clifford Brown and kind of clings their clock. I mean, he is, he is right now, in my opinion right now, the best brass player ever. And no one has beat him yet. So, uh, but here's the thing. Here's, here's the one side of the equation. If Maynard was alive right now, uh, he's not going to be a good choice for your teacher to show you how to increase your range and your endurance. Uh, give me an example, Maynard would, uh, you can watch clinics on YouTube, and I've even talked to Maynard a couple times after his concerts at Jazz Alley in Seattle, which is where I saw him most of the time. That's also where I saw Arturo and some other people. Well, he, he's just gonna tell you about breathing and his yoga breath, and he's gonna talk about an energy demand. He's gonna talk about making sure um, that your feet are um, shoulder width apart and you bend your knee that uh, -uh. that works for him because he's Maynard Ferguson it won't work for you I will guarantee it and so all the people that I mentioned they've spent their whole career playing a tremendous amount and what have they done very little of very little teaching very little teaching very little teaching I say out of the ones that I mentioned um, probably um, Roger Ingram seems like he really knows what he's doing when it comes to teaching. So not taken away from his playing, but he's obviously spent some time working with people and he's able to, to convey some of the techniques that helped him get to where he is um, uh, to students. But still, Roger has a tremendous amount of natural talent, and when you have that kind of talent, you can't convey all that to somebody who doesn't have the talent. So, um, as far as just studying jazz, I think, um, I, you know, I haven't met Bobby Shue, I haven't talked to him personally, but I've known, I've had some people come through my course that have actually taken jazz lessons from him, and it seems like as far as learning jazz, um, or even lead trumpet style, and you can't really go wrong with Bobby Shue, um, has he really developed a, a crazy, amazing upper register and endurance program. Um, I haven't heard about it. So, but if you wanted to really put the spit shine on your jazz or your lead trumpet playing, I think he's the man. Um, all the other people I mentioned are some of the best trumpet players in the world, uh, either living or now deceased. Uh, uh -uh. There's no track record there. There's no experience um, of teaching and really being able to convey the techniques for the student, mainly because these people have a tremendous amount of natural talent. When you have, when you can just play long tones and start playing a couple of high notes and all of a sudden you get, you know, to be fantastically better than the average trumpet player, um, that's talent. Um, the rest of us actually have to work on strategy and do a bunch of different things to really increase our range and endurance. And I'm one of those guys. I feel like I have a little bit of talent and a huge work ethic, and then a brain that thinks outside the box, and that's how I, I got to where I am right now. And when you hear me play, you need to keep in mind, I'm spending most of my time teaching. I mean, if I played full-time, watch out, baby. <laughs> I'm gonna be on fire, you know? When I played full-time, I was on fire. I didn't feel like anybody could really touch me. So um, I'm not joking about that. But when you hear me play, even the last thing I did with uh, recently with Maynard Ferguson's Ole, you're you're watching a guy who's not playing full time. I spend most of my time teaching you, and that's quite rewarding. Now that may switch. Um, I kind of the pendulum swings back and forth, and um, just depending on how things go. I mean, I may get uh, back into playing. And personally, I'd like to get back into. Um, doing my own thing which I did before and I want to branch out into do, doing smaller ensemble jazz stuff so uh, but right now I'm still focusing on teaching and so uh, now the other equation so you're smart enough not to go to the the best player in the world because they just play they mainly don't teach so you decide to go to a guy who teaches 
but doesn't play. Or if he does play, he doesn't exhibit the extraordinary amount of um, flair and pizzazz and sizzle up in that upper register. So now you got a person who, now what's wrong with that? Well, you got a person who's operating on theory. Um, use your noggins here, brass folks. If the person you're studying with can't demonstrate what they're teaching you, um, then how good is that teaching going to be for you? Not that good. They're going to be rehashing stuff that their professor, their trumpet professor, for example, trumpet, was given them when they were pursuing their DMA, okay, or they were pursuing their MM. So these people tend to rehash and regurgitate stuff that their teacher before them, who also really can't play, except for the typical cl classical orchestral excerpts and stuff like that, well, they're regurgitating that for you. And, but they can't really demonstrate an exceptional ability in the upper register. Uh, case in point, I had a college instructor like that uh, when I was uh, getting my bachelor's. Probably the, one of the best uh, all-around trumpet players in the Nashville area. But when it came to doing the stuff that I wanted to do and playing Maynard, Bill Chase, and executing extremely well in the upper and extreme red, red, upper and extreme upper register, uh, my particular instructor could not do that. And so, um, um, you know, I had to figure out this stuff on my own. So where does that leave you? Um, you can take some, take lessons from somebody local. Um, it's usually going to be somebody that was recommended. Maybe uh, he or she is a teacher at the community college, or maybe he or she is the principal of trumpet in some major metropolitan orchestra or symphony. Yeah, those kind of teachers are going to be good for working on your musical phrasing, your style your tone, your sound, uh, maybe even your power to some extent, your technique, your fingers. Uh, if I didn't mention accuracy and sight reading and um, um, etudes and all this kind of stuff, they're not really going to help you too much in, in pursuit of upper register endurance. And so the reason I mention that is if you already feel like you got some decent technique under your belt, You've already gone through some of the classical um, orchestral excerpts. Maybe you even played in an orchestra. You played in a big band. You've done this, so you already kind of feel like you have a decent foundation there. Then you don't need to be studying with your local instructor who's just going to be going over um, uh, the techniques I just mentioned. You're going to have to find somebody who can do both. And unfortunately, that's the conundrum, the dilemma. That's your plight, is to find somebody who can do both. And that's very difficult to find. Um, you're either going to have to be lucky enough to live in a city where someone has demonstrated the fact that they can play extraordinarily well in the upper register and really sound good, not sound like you know someone squealing or a stuck pig or a chainsaw. They have to really, really sound good and execute um, accurately and flawlessly. You have to verify that. Either you go hear them in a concert, you go hear them at a rehearsal, or you check out their videos um, that they did. And you want to see a video of them performing live, not a video of them recording an MP3 and putting it to pictures um, in a YouTube video. You'd like to see them uh, performing live, I mean, on a recorded video. So that would be one way. And then you want to find out who have they been teaching and what do those students have to say about them. That's the other way. So I've given you two strategies to find out the teacher that you need to be studying with. So um, written statements and written testimonials and reviews are decent. But let's face it, folks, those can be forged and made up. I mean, if I wanted to, right now I could stop this video and I could sit down and, and make up about 20 or 30 written testimonials about myself and put in a bunch of names and just throw it on my website, you know, or throw it out there on some blog. So you don't really know if that's um, authentic or not. What is authentic? An individual making a video and either talking or playing or both about that particular instructor. That is the real deal. So when you're looking for an instructor to help you with the physical part of this and improving your chops and your endurance, you need to look for the instructor that can demonstrate um, they actually have the facility and expertise in the upper register. And that's not just in some studio. They got to have been out there on stage doing it. Um, the second thing is you want to make sure that they can teach. 
and the, the way you ascertain that is by video reviews and video testimonials of that particular teacher. The less video reviews that teacher has, the more I would be skeptical and the more that I would doubt that particular individual. I mean, how do you know if he can teach? Maybe he can play well, but he's now he's in that other camp. He can't teach. The reason this is all very important is number is for two reasons, your time and your money. So either you're going to waste both of them, or if you're rich, well, you're, you're going to at least waste your time. So, I mean, if you get with a local instructor or somebody in the symphony or the DMA and trumpet professor at your local college, university, or a guy that has his MM at your community college, well, uh, the reason if you didn't do your homework on this right, you might study with this person for six months and pay them $50 a lesson once a week, so that's $200, right? Six months, now you spend over a grand on this particular instructor and you realize after six months you've gone nowhere. You've gotten nowhere. But then you've also wasted six months. Six months that you could have spent with the right teacher and really got somewhere. So use your noggin on this one, brass players. You have to do a little bit of homework. A little bit of homework will save you a lot of grief, a lot of time, and a lot of money. And for you rich uh, people out there, um, and I get some of those in my courses, you know, that are businessmen and they have a lot of money, you don't, I mean, even if a thousand bucks doesn't matter to you, you still don't want to waste six months, do you? I mean, we all have, um, you know, a value on our time, and you don't want to waste six months studying with somebody who's really not going to help you out, regardless if you don't care about the money. So these are things that you need to really think about, investigate, and do your homework. So. To recap, there is a conundrum, a dilemma for most brass players, most advanced brass players seeking to improve their range and endurance on the instrument. And we already um, notated that the celeb trumpet players, the most fantastic brass players in the world, have spent their whole career playing and not showing others how to do it. There's a whole world of different a difference in playing and teaching folks uh, just because you can play this like Maynard Ferguson doesn't mean that you can teach uh, little little Johnny who just got into college you know how to improve their endurance and range it doesn't doesn't work that way um, it's you might think it's logical but no it, it doesn't work that way the other thing is finding the teacher that can actually teach you and uh, who can also walk the walk and we already mentioned that most teachers that you're going to go to, your local teacher, the, the guy or gal at the community college level with their, their masters, um, the university professor who has their DMA, um, the guy that's you know, you know, playing your, um, or your major city orchestra, they're not really going to be able to teach you unless you follow the homework steps I gave you. Um, watch them in concert exhibiting amazing abilities in the upper register and um, sound and tone and accuracy or watch videos of them doing it live uh, when they were recorded live on a video. Hope this helps out. Uh, this video is an important one because it could save you a tremendous amount of money and a tremendous amount of time. Uh, people don't really think too much uh, when they're taking an hour lesson once a week and they're just given 50. It doesn't seem like a whole lot, you know, or let's just say you got a deal of 40. It doesn't matter, 40 or 50. And you're doing that once a week. Um, you do that for six months. You've given somebody over a grand. I mean, over a thousand bucks, and um, all your time. And so a lot of people are just not thinking about that. And then it catches up with them, and they realize that they've spent over a thousand dollars, and they got zip to show for it. Think about it. You're smart. You can do this. Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson and welcome to my channel. That's youtube.com slash your brass instructor. Thanks for just watching the video that you did. Maybe it's the first one that you've watched or maybe you've watched tons of my videos. In fact, as of June 2016, as a brass player and trumpet player, I have the most tutorials free on the planet. I have over 600 videos on my YouTube channel currently, all free. So again, thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. 
A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day. around a little bit with Dr. Charles Colon. This is actually the very last study in volume three if you have the red book which is volumes one two and three. Big red book with white lettering Dr. Charles Colon advanced lip drills and lip flexibilities. So I'm just willy-nilly picking out um, you know, about three of these but what you do is when you get done you do a power double pedal note at the end and so you're you got this tessitura that's from here i mean it's just an amazing tessitura when you get done it ends on a uh, well the way it goes in the colon book it ends on a double a of course you if you've seen my um, advanced lip flexibilities approach and beyond we go well past that don't ever get to the end of any book and think that you've arrived. There's many other things that you can do beyond that. So the first one um, is starting out in seventh position. But we got to add the first valve. Now that's going to put us in seventh position for the A flat. So 
Wow. Let's uh, bring it up to um, third, what would be third position. Um, that should be a high C, but of course we're not going to play it in the, the right fingering for the trill. First bell. And this wears you out. I've actually done this before I started the video. Um, just wanted to make sure that I was kind of succinct and efficient in doing the video and not just um, thinking out loud. So I've already done a whole series of these and I can, I can already feel it. I mean, my chops are already somewhat kind of from doing that. So you always want to keep things coming out a different angle, different angle, right? Different angles. You can't do the same damn long, to long tone routine, flexibility routine, high note routine you gotta always mix stuff up or you end up hitting a plateau you get stuck in a rut and you're going nowhere fast and then it actually gets worse after that you know that right because after that then you start having more bad days or days where your chops can't go all the way to the end of rehearsal or performance um, more days where you feel like you're just playing right on your teeth there's no cushion here left so you got to keep mixing it up and this is, I'm showing you something here that you could throw into your routine. Now, this doesn't take too long. If you, if you take all my talking out and just put in some normal rest, it really doesn't take that long. Probably, we're talking less than five minutes for the whole shebang. Okay, so we're going to end on open position in this particular study. But of course, we're not going to play it first. Now, you know that's a high D. You didn't see I was actually um, creating a wider aperture tilting the horn up dropped my chin and create this different angle and I was blowing so much air that it was actually blowing the mouthpiece off my lips I don't know if you caught that that's what was really going on there my lips quit vibrating for just a split second and the air kind of pushed the mouthpiece um, off my um, lips let's see if I can do that last one one more time and keep it from doing that I think maybe if I come in with a little bit more narrow aperture, but still pivot the horn up, which you know you can't use your normal embouchure for any of the double pedal tones. It's just not really going to come out the way we want it. I tilt the horn up, draw down. Slide, you're also sliding the mouthpiece up higher on the top lip, regardless of what typical mouthpiece placement you use. That was about three F's. I mean, that's powering out uh, double pedals right there. That was loud, really loud. Uh, okay, there you have it. That's the um, Dr. Charles Colon lip flexibilities, but tweaked my way, Kurt Thompson, and adding in power, double pedals in the fourth tier. Let me tell you, um, all you gotta do, you can do the whole thing. You notice I skipped every other, right? I did, um, I did 7th um, position, 5th position, 3rd position, open, right? But you can do each one. A flat, A, B flat, B natural, C, um, D flat, D. So um, if you want to do all 7, you could. A lot of times I don't have time for that. I'm just mainly doing this to kind of shock on all the chops. And I don't do this every day because then you get used to it. So I'll do something kind of hardcore like this. Um, I don't know, twice a week. Um, sometimes I'll wait once a week and really go after it. You're just trying to throw something different in the mix. If you keep your routine always the same, you will always be the same. You will never really expand and get any better. 
I wonder if I can do a bonus one. Um, no, I like to go beyond the 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 uh, colon book. So what could I do that would be a little bit of a bonus? So we ended on open position on D, and then we got E flat, um, E, F, um, um, I we could try one on F. So I'm going to play, I'm not going to use the alternate fingerings. So you bum, bum, bum. I'm just going to use the real fingering for F. I think as you get beyond upper register, it doesn't really matter so much anyway. You can almost play any, any, any valve and it's still going to come out. Yep, right on it. It must have been around double C, right? So it's coming out like a double D flat. Um, uh, but anyway, um, that's not easy. <laughs> Especially after doing these um, power double B flats and uh, double pedals you know well actually more than that right you can count them uh and go back and rewind the video so uh this is a more advanced um, tutorial so i don't care what what level you play at let's just pretend pretend you play at the top tier lead trumpet level or you're some symphonic dude or principal trumpet of new york metropolitan orchestra you do this one and you're gonna blink I'll see you in the next one. You know I will. Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson, and welcome to my channel. That's youtube.com slash your brass instructor. Thanks for just watching the video that you did. Maybe it's the first one that you've watched, or maybe you've watched tons of my videos. In fact, as of June 2016, as a brass player and trumpet player, I have the most tutorials free on the planet. I have over 600 videos on my YouTube channel currently, all free. So again, thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day. All right, this will be an advanced version, and a very advanced version of the Dr. Charles Advanced Lip Trills for Trumpet. This is coming out of the very back of the book, but I've tweaked it my own way to be highly, highly advanced. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is, once you've finished that book and you've mastered up to lip trilling up to double A, uh -uh. you're not done. You're really not done.
Hope you like that one. Page 48, number 184. Herbert L. Clark says, The following is my daily endurance test. It should be practiced four times in one breath. All right. 184. <laughs> Louis Majo. Well, if him and his method and routine were the panacea and the Holy Grail to trumpet playing, brass playing, why wouldn't we all be doing it? Well, the fact of the matter is a lot of us have done it, but not enough to say it's the Holy Grail to trumpet playing. Um, along with stamps, I feel like it, there's some similarities with stamps and the Gordon. Um, some mouthpiece buzzing, lip buzzing, long tones, and things like that. He does talk about certain amateur positions, like um, uh, forward jaw position, just you know some other things like that. Um, his stuff is worthy of taking a look at, worthy of maybe even possibly incorporating into your daily practice. Do I think if you just practice only Louis Macho that you're going to become the world's greatest lead trumpet player, the world's greatest trumpet player playing the style of Maynard Ferguson? The guy that, or the girl that can get on the piccolo trumpet and do the Michael Hyde and the Brandenburg and the Vivaldi and A-flat. No, I don't think by just doing Louis Maggio that you're going to do all that. So it is not the holy grail to, to brass and trumpet playing, but it is worthy of taking a look at. It has helped many, more than just a few. The Louis Maggio system has helped more than just a couple, more than a handful. It helped a lot of people. Um, it's helped me a little bit. I like, I like this stuff. Um, if I compare it to Claude Gordon, no, for me, well, Gordon helped me out more than the Maggio. I mean, but I also spent 104 weeks on the Claude and Gordon. But uh, Louis Maggio stuff is good. So that's my take on Louis Maggio. And I'm Kurt Thompson. That's my story. Sticking to it, baby. Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson and welcome to my channel. That's youtube.com slash your brass instructor. Thanks for just watching the video that you did. Maybe it's the first one that you've watched or maybe you've watched tons of my videos. In fact, as of June 2016, as a brass player and trumpet player, I have the most tutorials free on the planet. I have over 600 videos on my YouTube channel currently, all free. So again, thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day.
So if the Cat Anderson method was the Holy Grail to trumpet playing, why aren't we all doing it? Well, um, <laughs> now let's just put it this way. To go through all 13 studies in the Cat Anderson method, you already need a fantastic amateur, a fantastic upper register, big time chops. I mean, I went through the original Chicken Scratch Cat Anderson method years ago and it gave me a run for my money. And I have really strong chops and can play in the extreme upper register. And um, it's um, a method that um, I think it was revised a couple years ago by a guy named Jeff Winstead, I believe, spelled not J-E-F-F, -F, but G-E-O-F-F. -F. And um, I tried to look up his playing and videos. I didn't really find much. And uh, before he kicked me off, um, his friend, his friends for Facebook, I kept saying, "Well, if this method it works that great, uh, let's you know, where's your playing at?" And he talked about stories about Cat Anderson rooming with him and him butting around with Cat Anderson. That's all great stuff. But the fact of the matter is, Jeff Winstead ended up admitting that he hadn't been able to go through the entire Cat Anderson method himself, the one that he revised and revamped. So what does that tell you? That tells you that Cat Anderson method is nowhere close to being the holy grail for trumpet players because most trumpet players can't even go through it. It's that freaking tough. Not even the guy who revised it, Winstead, can go through it. So what does that tell you? Um, if you already have superb, fantastic chops, you're probably playing in the professional arena like I am, then you want to challenge yourself, buy the damn Cat Henderson method, buy the new one from Jeff Winstead for all I care, and go through it, and you're going to go, holy crap, after you go through about three or four of those. Um, holding out a G for 20 minutes, holding out a middle C for 20 minutes is just part of the fun you are in store with. So, um, Cat Anderson does have some worthy techniques. I love the 20 minute whisper quiet G, just love it. Um, I don't love too much else about it. Uh, for me, I guess, if I want to challenge myself, I'll go through some of his, his, um, later studies, like 10, 11, 12, but, um, it's a challenge for me. And it's not going to really do anything. It's not going to make me get that much better. Definitely not the Holy Grail. To trumpet playing. That's the Cat Anderson method I just reviewed and um, I want most people to shy away from that one unless you want to tear yourself up to pieces. I'm Kurt Thompson. That's my story. Let's get into it. Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson and welcome to my channel. That's youtube.com slash your brass instructor. Thanks for just watching the video that you did. Maybe it's the first one that you've watched, or maybe you've watched tons of my videos. In fact, as of June 2016, as a brass player and trumpet player, I have the most tutorials free on the planet. I have over 600 videos on my YouTube channel currently, all free. So again, thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day. Hey, just a short little talk about why I do what I do and the importance of building your range and your endurance. Kind of the endurance will follow the range. Believe it or not, I do get quite a lot of haters. Um, some of them will comment right on my post and some of them will email saying that all I care about is playing high notes, 
and being cocky and egotistical and all that kind of stuff. And there's more to this instrument, there's more to music than playing high notes. People got me wrong. That is not correct. What a lot of people fail to recognize is you will not be playing too much music if this is weak. If you don't have all the notes on this guy at your disposal, as many as that you can get. Not only that, life is difficult. And um, this thing can start to hurt after a while if you use too much pressure. And you're also limited on what you can do as far as the different styles. So I just happen to have this natural knack when it comes to upper register. But instead of being born with the talent like some of the celebrity trumpet players that have a fantastic range and seem to never get tired, I actually had to work at it. I had to figure out how to build my range up. There was no um, high note trumpet teacher when I was growing up teaching high notes. So as far as just building, you see my stuff and it says, you know, increase your range for four notes or learn how to play a little higher this or strengthen your, lo your lips or your chops. And some people are like, man, that's crazy. I, I want to spend time on making music. Well, this instrument is a physical instrument, folks, and I'm here to tell you, man, it is unforgiving. You can have a lot of fights with this with this instrument. It could also be a trombone or tuba. It doesn't matter. Um, but a lot of times the instrument will win, and the reason is because you haven't developed this. And just because you increase your range and got all these high notes at your disposal, does that mean you got to be a screaming fool? No. So when I'm talking about adding high notes to your range, I'm not going around trying to beat everybody over the head saying, you get these high notes because you're going to be able to scream and hang over at the end of songs all the time. No. Just because you have, if you're playing trumpet, if you have a double high C, does that mean you ever got to play it? If you don't want to. It's just nice to know that you got it. And if you have a double high C range, even if you play in the symphony, everything else is going to be easier. Your tone is going to be better. Your endurance is going to be a million times better because you're not crunching not your lips with the mouthpiece. Um, your pitch center is going to be better. Um, I already mentioned maybe sound and resonance. Tuning will be better. Your slotting and accuracy. It, everything gets better and it gets easier. Just imagine right now for most people watching this video how easy it is to play like low C up to second line G. But maybe when you were fourth or fifth grade it wasn't that easy. But right now, um, whether you're an advanced or a pro player, I mean, isn't that a ridiculous comment? Imagine how easy it is to play low C's and G's. The reason it's easy, or one of the reasons, is because your range is so far above that. Playing low C, E, G, and even middle C is a piece of cake. It's a cakewalk. That's kind of the premise um, behind my philosophy of wanting to keep building range and power, is that you don't have to hot dog all the time. If you, if you do want a hot dog, you got it. It's there. You can use it. But you don't have to do that if you're not that type of personality. What's going to happen is if you have the extra range, all the stuff that you play in now gets easier. Your endurance doubles and triples. Your tone gets better. I mean, just the stuff I just mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, that's why you increase your range. It's not about being a meathead and going to your gig and blowing a bunch of high notes for your warm-up and being that guy or that girl. It's not about that. It's about the ability to really enjoy your life and be fulfilled on your instrument and make it as easy and as fun loving as possible. Um, what would be the other reason for the range? Um, I'm drawing a blank now. But um, the, what I said previously, that's pretty much really what I want to share with every, everybody in this video. You see my stuff, I'm saying, hey, you got to build up your range. Come on, let's do it. I'm, I'm, I'm giving some incentives here. Let's do this. Because um, people have told me, and I kind of feel the same thing, I kind of am good at taking information, especially when it comes to range and upper register, and passing it on to students. So um, anyway, so you see me trying to get you involved in some of the stuff I do. And in case you didn't know it, I've made a post recently. I'm not all about the dollar, the almighty buck. I got over 400 videos on my YouTube channel. Just search my name or search your brass instructor. I got a ton of free stuff, stuff that you can even take your horn out and start practicing with. Yes, 
go check it out. You're just not going to run out of videos. I got demos that you can play along with. I got tutorials that you can learn from. Um, you're going to have a lot of stuff to work on there, all for free. And just recently, I was offering some free um, weeks for my course. Um, if people would, you know, let me know how many, for example, C's they could lip buzz or they could do in their mouthpiece. I guess that was too hard for most everybody, so we'll scratch that one. So bottom line is, um, I basically don't care who's watching this and how good you are. Um, I feel like if you're the best professional lead player in the world, what guess what I think that you're probably still working on your range I really do you may may not want to admit it I believe that the best strongest brass players on the in the world that have arrived they got a, maybe a great gig or whatever or maybe they're one of the top call a list session players I believe they are still working on their range and endurance and their sound they didn't stop it so what should that tell everybody else it's a lifelong pursuit on this, this instrument. You're going to keep working on your range. You're going to keep working on your sound and your tone and your power and getting better and better. It really doesn't stop. So I'm Kurt Thompson. I wanted to give you a little, more, a little bit more insight about me, why I do what I do, and um, why it looks like so far people uh, have gotten some uh, pretty good value for the um, information that I've been passing along. So if you've got extra time, Go to youtube.com slash your brass instructor and dig in. You won't get done with it anytime soon. There's a ton of information there. It's all free. And uh, anyway, then you know all you know about my other courses that I'm always um, throwing up here on um, Facebook and, and LinkedIn and other places. And so those are always there for you too if you really want to get serious and uh, pull the trigger and uh, be totally wowed as to what will happen with your range. Remember you got this much range and if you play down here life is easy if you got this much range and you play here life isn't so easy folks see you hey class is in session and um, you should just know that there's just a lovely 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 huge um, oil painting that I got for my place a couple months ago just absolutely love it yeah it is on oil on canvas but we're this we're not here to study art at least not this kind of art we're here to study this kind of art would that did you catch something there would that say can you correctly name these notes for trumpet can you hmm by the way I've noticed some of you on Facebook are subscribers at my YouTube channel, and I'd love for you to go over there and show your support. It's very easy to do. Just go to YouTube, and I know you can click on a link, or you can put my name in it. And anyway, I come up pretty decently at YouTube, and once you get to my channel, just click on subscribe, and you'll get notifications instantly when I put stuff up online, or seen on my website. Okay, there's a problem all across the planet, and most of the problem lies with professional classical trumpet players, symphonic and orchestral trumpet players, and university professors. They can't name the right notes. And we're going to find out why that is, why even somebody that's 80 years old or looks it and he's a university professor or maybe even she, and they can't get the name of the damn note right. So this is going to be some brutal logic for these people. First of all, you know what a trumpet looks like. And uh, let me go get my trumpet just for, for fun. I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure. Okay. Now let's, let me. I want you to look at the bell of the trumpet here. Do you see a piano growing out of the end of the bell of my trumpet? Do you see a piano in there at all? No, this is a trumpet. Now here's going to be a pop quiz for anybody, but really 
if this is being shown in a classroom where there is a university professor, you got five seconds to give me the ultimate definition for the question I'm going to pose. Here you go. You ready? I'm going to count to five and then I'm going to answer it. But just like getting these notes wrong, wrongly labeled, the university professor and even the classical symphonic trumpet player is going to get this wrong. We're not going to be able to come up with a good answer. Give me the simplest and most accurate definition of music. Three, four, five. Music is the organization of sounds through time. That's it, folks. You can't get more accurate and more simple than that. It's not music as an organization of sound and piano and how all the other instruments and voices on the planet relate to that instrument. No, ma'am. No, ladies, it's not. Let me repeat. The definition of the word music is the organization of sound through time. That means I could cough or burp and make it music if I wanted to. and would have nothing at all to do with piano. Zero. Got that straight? Now, we don't play piano. I'm talking to trumpet players. We happen to play an instrument called trumpet. And we have our own notes. And I'm a trumpet player and I speak to trumpets. Now, if I was a band director, I might have to give you a code word to let you know what you're going to be playing. Or so I'm speaking your language. And you know that code word is everybody, right? Concert. So the band director would say, I want everybody to play concert, whatever, concert B-flat or concert F. Well, the trumpet players know that that's, they're not going to play B-flat. They're going to play their C. Okay. Big deal if the piano happens to ha have the C note come out when you strike a C, and we happen to have a B-flat. We're playing a different instrument, folks. Not trying to be like piano. Now let's go to this little tutorial. Let's find out what we're dealing with here. Let's find out why so many of the advanced players in, in the hierarchy of academia get this wrong. Okay. So what's the name of this note, anybody? Right there. It is, I'm holding the camera. Low G. Okay. You agree with that? You agree with that? Or is that pedal G? Look carefully. It's actually low G, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Now think about this brutal logic that's going to kill a lot of people. Now we're playing our instrument. That's a low G for trumpet. I don't care what it is for bassoon, didgeridoo, piano, harpsichord, color to a soprano. I don't care what it is for anybody else, but for me and for people who play trumpet. Now, what do you suppose the next note above it is right here? Is that also a low G? No. Folks, that note right there is a middle G. It's not another low G. So some people get confused because they think of it as low. You know, because it's a relatively easy note for us to play, isn't it? But a G set on the second line in the trumpet clef staff is definitely not a low G. We already have a low G. There it is. There's low G. There's, ooh, middle G. You following the logic here, folks? I know it's tricky. Now, what do we got coming up right there? The little goose egg sitting on top of the staff. What is that note? 
Come on, you can get it. If you said it's another middle G, you'd be wrong because this is actually high G. Boom. Does that look like a G, kind of? <laughs> All right. So, no, that is not another middle G. You got low, middle, high G. Now, the reason people get this confused, too, is because when they play that G on top of the staff, they don't think of it as that high. Ask any alto or, or soprano, or let's be more specific, alto or mezzo-soprano in a choir if that note would be considered a middle note or a low note they're going to say no way that's a that's a high g right of course they will they're not going to say that's a low or that's middle now what about this note here way way right there way up there in the clouds way up there in the clouds what is the name of that note? Is it high G? Kind of, kind of, but no. When you already got a high, a high designated note like high G, you are confused to say that's also high G. So there has to be another wording there so high is in the name but folks that's what we call a double high G there's high G if you take that an octave over we double the highness of it we can't call that note right there a high G way up in the in the um, clouds because that's that's a high G there. So to make it simple, we call this note double high G, and some of us jazzers call it double G, double G, double G. Does any of this make sense? I bet there's someone out there with a PhD or a DMA right now who this does not make any sense. But for the rest of us, it should make sense. There might even be some principal trumpet player that's been playing in an orchestra or, or a symphony for the last 30 years about ready to retire who would look at this and say, no, that doesn't make any sense. How does he coming up with all this? It just... It just can't be. The G on top of the staff is not high. It's got to be middle. And therefore the G way up in the clouds, that's got to be a high G. Wrong. We got low G, because that's not a pedal tone. Low G, middle G, high G, an octave higher, double high G, or double G. You getting that, folks? Now, why do you suppose so many classical players, especially, and university professors, and let's just face it, folks, probably 90% or more of all university professors, trumpet professors, are mainly classical trumpet players. Let's just face it. There's not too many crossover um, lead trumpet, jazz trumpet, and classical um, trumpet players at the higher education level. Not really that many. So more than 90% will be mainly classical. So why is there such a problem? Well, one reason is most classical trumpet players do not play in that range all the time. They don't play a, too much above high C and high D. And when they do play those notes, what are they using? They're not using a big B-flat trumpet. They're using their piccolo almost 100% of the time. If they're playing Fs and Gs, it's on a piccolo. Okay? So you have to consider they are definitely not the expert in upper register pedagogy, 
upper register speak or notes in the upper register. And that's one reason that they get it wrong because they're, they're just not playing up there that much. But let's give you the other reason why. Let's go over to this. Now, what do we got here? We got kind of almost the same deal, except it's lower. Okay. So, let's take a look at that. These are all G's. What are these notes? What is that note? We know what that note is, right? Let's just start with that note. What's that note? A couple more seconds. That's an F. In fact, folks, here's where people get screwed up. It's so close to our middle G, but because of our instrument, is that a middle F or a low F? If you guessed a low F, you would be correct. And that's why it's confusing. Low F, oh, wait a minute, that's middle G. How could that be? They're so close. It's because the acoustic of our instruments. Now let's, or the trumpet, the acoustic of the trumpet. Let's go down to this note. What's the name of that note? Well, we know it's F. Okay, sorry for my fingers. We know it's F, but is that low F? No, folks. And this is why some jazzers also get this note wrong when they call this top note double F, double high F. It's not. So this is where I think people are getting confused. That note is not a low F. It's what we call a pedal. If I can get this to stay still. Uh, there we go. Pedal F. The acoustics of the trumpet. Are like this. I'm not going to actually that's a whole nother tutorial. I'm not going to go into it. Bottom line, the lowest natural note on the trumpet is low F sharp, fingered one, two, and three. Low F sharp. Now, that's a half step higher than this F natural. What happens if you go below the low F sharp, fingered one, two, and three, you actually go into the range of the pedal tones. And pedal tones although they are legitimate in some respects, for the natural harmonic acoustics of our instrument, the trumpet, we start counting at the low F sharp, not at the pedal, pedal notes. Therefore, the lowest, the first F that we come to is what? That one. So the F in the, the staff, let's see if I can get this going here. That's actually a low F. Ooh, are we clearing some of the confusion? Now that's a low F. It really is confusing because there's a middle G. There's a low F. We don't have any low F down there in this range where the low G is because that's a pedal F and not a natural note on the trumpet. If we go up an octave higher, now what do we got there? Middle F. So that's middle F. Let's see if I can get this paper to stay still. Middle F. Now would a lot of altos and mezzo sopranos call that high? Yeah. A lot of them would not say that's a middle note in their middle range. They're singing up to F. Of course, you know, most of them get, can get that note. They can go higher, but they would not call that a low note or a middle note. They would definitely say that's on the higher side. But for trumpets, we call it middle F. Now, the last note, what's that note above those ledger lines, still way up in the clouds? And there's where a lot of lead trumpet players and commercial trumpet players get this wrong. The classical guys do not get this wrong. <laughs> They're going to call that the right, the classical guys and the professors are going to call this 
the right note. It's actually called if this paper would just stay still. Okay. So that note is high F in most university professors and principal trumpet players and orchestras and symphonies and classical trumpet players all around the globe would call that high F. And this is one reason they make the mistake. They go right over there and they go, well, ooh, that note right there is a high G. Because look, high F, high G. High F, high G. Wrong. <laughs> look, I've outlined the whole structure of everything for the benefit of people who've been doing this for a long time in telling their students, can you believe that we're getting spurious facts about what the name of notes are, the real accurate names are? And I've just outlined why. Isn't that crazy? I had someone email me, no, no, someone left a comment on one of my YouTube videos of, that, you know, said, you know, why are you so up in arms about university professors? It seems like you're bashing them and you must not like academia. The truth of the matter is maybe one day, who knows, I might like to have a, you know, a DMA suffix after my name. That'd be pretty cool. So no, I'm not knocking the degree. I'm not knocking the intelligence. Um, most of the time, it's the people behind that degree and their attitude and their ability. A lot of times, doesn't really fit that degree, in my opinion. It's like they almost got that degree just to make themselves feel better about their own plane and their own talent. I believe that the intelligence and the plane and the talent come first and then the degree. So, no, I mean, who knows? You know, I'm going to have to get a lot older and more balder and a lot more grayer. But um, once that happens, I could definitely fit into the higher education and have, you know, doctorate of music arts right after my name. That'd be pretty cool. And I'm, I'm still kind of considering that. But I don't need that to play at my level and teach other professional players. I don't need to have the suffix to have the intelligence and the knowledge of... Um, my instrument. So, you heard it here, folks. <laughs> Let that stick in your brain just for a little bit. Look at that. There you go. This was called Can You Correctly Name These Notes for Trumpet? Not piano, not soprano, not didgeridoo or a zither, or a harmonica, but for trumpet. We play trumpet. Let's not confuse things. And if you're a student, you really ought to share this video to your university trumpet professor. I'm Kurt Thompson. Hope you enjoy this on the house trumpet lesson for you. It didn't cost you anything, did it? I'll see you in the next one. So long for now. Hey, the traffic is moving. What am I doing? It's called kicking ass and not making any excuses. Keep your horn with you all the time. I'm in the Houston traffic right now. It's flooding like mad, crazy. But I bring my ax with me wherever I go so when I get in traffic or for when things are slow and crazy, I can whip out my horn and keep it going. No excuses. I'm not done. I can't leave you guys 
with that tension and that chord of what I was playing. I forgot two notes. Hold on a second. See if I can get them out. Oh, yeah, here we go. I can do it. There we go. Doesn't that make it all better now? Yeah. Okay. So I often get asked, look, we know that trumpet is the superior instrument for the entire brass family. We know that. That's obvious. But, Kurt, why do you really feel that the trumpet is the best of all the brass instruments? And we're talking about tuba, French horn, euphonium, baritone, trombone. And I'm going to lump cornet and trumpet kind of in the same category, so they're about the same. Pay attention, okay? Pay very, very, very close attention. I don't know if I really want this to get out, because if I did, we might have a lot of converts from the bass clef up to the triple clef. And uh, maybe even a French horn player might convert. But here's the main reason that trumpet is the superior instrument of the brass family. Ready? You're not going to believe this. Yes. You know, how many times have we had an itch on our back? And look at it, I can get way on down there. Isn't that nice? Oh, yeah. Get way on down there. You're looking at it, folks. This is the reason that trumpet is superior and the best instrument of the entire brass family. Just try doing that with the tuba player. Without a tuba player, have the tuba player try to do it with his tuba or her tuba. Try doing that with a trombone. Mm -mm. French horn? Yeah, French horn's iffy. I, it might be. What if you dropped it? <laughs> there goes a $5,000 con uh, down the drain. So, you heard it from me, folks. Trumpet is the best and the most superior instrument of the brass family. One more time, you said? One more time? Sure, one more time? Okay, here we go. You just cannot do this successfully with uh, any other brass instrument except for trumpet. That is why when you see a tuba player practicing and you see a trombone player practicing and others you know that little wooden back scratcher that you can get at 7-eleven or circle k looks about like that long that's why you see a lot of them with those little makeshift back scratchers and that's another reason i think trumpet players are actually quite independent we don't have to depend on another device to scratch our backs when we're practicing you heard it here first i believe folks because i haven't heard anybody else talk about this it's a secret that's been kind of on the down low, kind of hush hush until now. But still, just keep it among your friends, okay? Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson, and welcome to my channel. That's youtube.com slash your brass instructor. Thanks for just watching the video that you did. Maybe it's the first one that you've watched, or maybe you've watched tons of my videos. In fact, as of June 2016, as a brass player and trumpet player, I have the most tutorials free on the planet. I have over 600 videos on my YouTube channel currently, all free. So again, thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day. in session. Down there. That's right. Class is in session and 
some people have doubted whether or not that my 90 days to razor sharp technique with the Herbert L. Clark book would actually be suitable for bass clef, bass clef instruments. Easy for me to say. And they doubted that there was actually a version of the Clark book for them. You can't, you can't hide from the Clark stuff anymore, trombone players, baritone players. Um, I haven't tested this out yet on tuba player, but I bet it could still, we could still make it work. You might have to transpose um, down an octave or something like that. Um, this is the guy that made it all happen, Claude Gordon. He was instrumental in revising this. Well, he didn't really revise it. He just transposed it for bass clef. It's pretty much the same thing. Yeah, so it's in the treble clef book. You can see that was um, edited by Claude Gordon. And so it goes just like the original book for treble clef, for trumpet and cornet. And with the first study starting off in chromatics, it's got the study that's the most popular, the most played in practice. The second study. And then of course it's accompanied with um, the etudes like you would expect in the original book. So now keep in mind, the whole, well one of the reasons for uh, my doing the Clark course that I have, and it's a standalone course, so you don't need me live in this particular course. In the upper register course, and maybe the lead trumpet course, yeah, uh, you're going to do a lot better the more that I'm involved. But in this particular course, um, for all instruments, whether you're doing trumpet, cornet, or if you um, are a bass clef player, you play trombone or euphonium baritone, um, I made the course such that it's a standalone course that you can work with me through the video format and you don't really need a lot of extra hand holding. So that's what's pretty cool about this course. See, what else can I say? Well, now you've seen the book. This is a real life book. I think it only cost me 15 bucks or something. Uh, where did I get it? I believe I got this at Sheet Music Plus. I believe. Either Amazon or Sheet Music Plus. It got to me real quick. Didn't cost much. Yeah, you can see on the back it was it says $16. Seems like I paid $15 or something for it. So anyway, um, if you want to get your slide technique faster and more accurate with more pop, um, or your, your typical finger technique for euphonium and baritone, possibly even tuba, um, this book goes right along with the Herbert L. Clark 90 Days to Razor Sharp Technique course I got, and the part two of that course, which is the A2 Companion course. I don't believe in working the etudes and exercises um, like Clark has you do it because that bogs you down and makes it more uh, inefficient. So that's why I have it um, divvied up into two parts. All right. Okay, trombone players, baritone and euphonium players, no more excuses. Get this book, get my course, and start shedding it. See ya. Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson and welcome to my channel. That's youtube.com slash your brass instructor. Thanks for just watching the video that you did. Maybe it's the first one that you've watched or maybe you've watched tons of my videos. In fact, as of June 2016, as a brass player and trumpet player, I have the most tutorials free on the planet. I have over 600 videos on my YouTube channel currently, all free. So again, thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, again, subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day.
if balanced embouchure was the holy grail to trumpet and brass playing, then why aren't we all doing it? Good question. So balanced embouchure, AKA Jeff Smiley. I bought his stuff eh, quite a long time ago. I think he came out with it around 2001, 2002, maybe 2003. Anyway, when I first went to his website, he made some pretty interesting claims. One was that this was like the method um, that would work for everybody, especially the people who have tried and failed other methods. He also had a little blurb on there about how not to bother him about his, you know, lack of playing demonstrations. And well, I went back and took another look at his website before I made this um, review and tutorial about the Holy Grail to um, trumpet playing and brass playing. I noticed that that language was no longer on there. In fact, he's saying that, um, you know, keep an open mind and check out Balance I'm sure it may or may not work for you. So he's changed the language of that. He still doesn't have any links to his plane, or if he did, I, I missed him. So that's one thing I like to see in a routine and a method is the person that authors a method that tells you you're going to be strong and start playing higher and better and your amateur is going to be great. Well, I want to see that person in action demonstrating that they can do that. And in this particular case, I don't really see that. So it could be he's out there and maybe I've missed it. And I guess if I have missed his incredible version of the Michael Haydn, um, some of the, the craziest, highest, most um, electric Maynard Ferguson stuff, or um, anything else, um, some fantastic lead playing that he did with Buddy Rich or uh, Woody Herman, I guess someone's going to probably point that out to me in a, some kind of negative hate um, email that I'm going to get. But basically, I haven't, I haven't seen that at all. So um, I got this method and it has some CDs with it. And it's, I'm trying to remember, it's quite a long time ago, I did try to change everything to the balanced armature. And um, you spend a lot of time in the double pedal tiers, tier four, I call it, double pedal C down to double pedal G flat. You spend a lot of time there. You spend a lot of time also doing some glissandos from that point. Uh, he doesn't really promote tier one and tier two and tier um, three pedal tones, which you're kind of leaving out a lot if you don't do that. But um, tier four are pretty decent pedal tones to be working on, so he does have you do that. He does have the process that you're going to go through. So I guess what I can say about this for myself, I didn't get anything out of it. But I imagine if you've tried other routines and you, and you kind of fell flat on your face, that the balance of armature could be the one that works for you. And I think that's even what he says for these players that were not able to play first chair and they've always had problems. They've always been stuck that the balance of armature routine and techniques have been quite helpful to these kind of players. So if you're that person and you've been stuck and you've tried other routines and courses and you still haven't gone anywhere, then you might want to consider Jeff Smiley's Balanced Amateur. Um, in my opinion, it's not the Holy Grail. Not every trumpet player and brass player on the planet is doing Balanced Amateur. So we know it's not the Holy Grail, but some people are doing it with tremendous success. So that's my story. This was about Jeff Smiley's Balanced Amateur, and I'm sticking to it, baby. Hi, I'm Kurt Thompson, and welcome to my channel. That's youtube.com slash your brass instructor. Thanks for just watching the video that you did. Maybe it's the first one that you've watched, or maybe you've watched tons of my videos. In fact, as of June 2016, as a brass player and trumpet player, I have the most tutorials free on the planet. I have over 600 videos on my YouTube channel currently, all free. So again, thanks again for watching this video. I hope that you got something out of it. Sometimes I make a video just to make you laugh. A lot of times I make a video to educate you on something and maybe even help solve a problem. So I hope something like that occurred for you in this video. And while you're at it, 
Again, subscribe, click on my website link, and go on to the next video. It's lovely out here. Have a great day. Another very, very good reason why you should be practicing roll in and roll out and accompanied by your lip buzzing. Lip buzzing not only builds up strength and flexibility and responsivity, depending on what you're doing, but it is also a practice in real time roll in and roll out. And I'm going to demonstrate that right now. So if you're having problems going up and going back down on the horn, although lip buzzing is not exactly what we're doing into the mouthpiece, so don't don't think that you, we're not lip buzzing does not does not equal exactly what we're doing when we're playing the horn, but it's an approximation. And so if you can get the roll in and roll out with your lip buzzing, you're just going to find it much easier on the horn. So roll, why don't you watch the real time roll in and roll out? on my lips without the horn. I've already demonstrated in another video on the horn. So I'm going to play a tester note of low C. I'll do a couple of these so you can kind of get it. Concert B flat low C. I'll buzz it. Now I'm going to roll out. You see the slight roll out and roll in as I'm going back and forth from low C to pedal C. Uh, what if we take that up an octave? Middle C. Let me get a better breath. Look around there, there. So there I was rolling out and rolling back in two octaves on my lips. And um, I'm not going to set in try, and try to set any record here on how many octaves I can do. But you're seeing the real time roll out and roll in. And if you're having trouble doing that on the horn, uh, you might consider doing a little bit of lip buzzing. Now, if you haven't done a lot of lip buzzing before, or you have and you haven't had good success, you really need to go to my YouTube YouTube channel and search lip buzzing. Or just put in lip buzzing Kurt Thompson because I have a plethora of lip buzzing tutorials. Um, most of them cautioning you to not do too much lip buzzing. Keep it as soft as you can to get the tone out. And taking lots and lots of breaks because you do just a little bit more lip buzzing then you really need and it can actually backfire on you and screw you up and so you don't need to get gun ho on lip buzz and do a half an hour of this a day and find that a couple days later you can't even play the horn because that's what will happen to you so uh, let's what if we went a little higher that last one was middle c that should be a high c with a little chip in there Take a breath, see if I can get that back up. All right. Hopefully, you were able to see my lips rolling in and rolling out. That's what we mean by roll in and roll out. Um, for those of you who still find it ambiguous or murky or foggy or unclear, or theoretical. It's not theory. We're talking about something that's really going on in the horn when you're playing this guy. So if you've been having trouble with the roll in and roll out, which is really essential for you to be able to maneuver all around the horn, whether you're going higher or whether you're going down lower, it's really essential that you have that down. 
if you don't have that down, what ends up happening is, well, it's the result of why most people sound the way they do. They sound choppy and brittle and stiff, and they don't have that really fluid, flowing, cantabile, singable sound, and instead they're choppy. And what they're, the reason that is is because they have to reset their embouchure uh, as they go high and have to reset their embouchure as they go lower. So the roll in and roll out in real time uh, allows you to maneuver through the various ranges of the horn without having to stop and start with the tongue, stop and start with the air, or constantly reset your embouchure and embouchure positioning to be able to accommodate the different ranges you're playing in. That's the whole reason for it. And so it's not just a um, talent or a skill set. It's a combination of just about everything. Strength, flexibility, skill set, and some talent. Um, where I made mention in the um, four octave glissando tutorials I did that that's pretty much a result of brute strength and power, not a lot of talent. The roll in and roll out does require a skill set. It's not about brute strength. It does require some talent, some skill set. Uh, you need to have practice on that. And of course, it does take a little bit of strength and flexibility. So one more time. Let's see what we can get here. Yeah. So the high C, and I'm just going to keep it high C and under for that way. That's just for everybody, okay? That should be a middle C. That was... Um, I'm actually kind of firing all cylinders this morning because that actually came out pretty decent. That was real-time rolling from high C down to low C and all the way back, that last couple that I did. So um, it might look easy to you on the video here, but when you start trying that lip buzz, you're going to go, oh my God, <laughs> it's tough. So lip buzzing in general is tough. It's actually the hardest thing that we can do in regards to our horn as far as embouchure and as far as playing. So the lip buzzing the hardest, mouthpiece buzzing is about moderate, and then of course playing the horn is the easiest. So that's how it goes. So uh, anyway, I'm Kurt Thompson, and if you want some amateur coaching for all brass instruments, what I just did is applicable to all brass instrument, brass instruments, not just trumpet. Um, if you got a pair of these, and you're playing to something that's metal like this, um, a lot of what I do applies to you regardless of what brass instrument that you play. So hopefully you found this video about rolling and roll out and lip buzzing and another reason why lip buzzing can be quite valuable in your uh, practicing uh, regimen. Until next time, keep the faith, buddy.